Welcome to my channel. This video is a demonstration of AI-assisted creativity. The stories told are taken from my book, Buridan the Boomer, which I wrote with editorial assistance and read back using synthetic audio. All the images in this video were generated by two AI engines, Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey. If you like the stories, please get hold of a copy of Buridan the Boomer. Let's go. Life was mostly good for Buridan and his sister in the early years. Family holidays were often memorable, but not always for the usual reasons. For example, a driving holiday to Cornwall in a pre-war grocery van, which was bought especially for the occasion. This vehicle stood over six feet tall at its highest point. It had bulbous front wheel arches over thick spoked wheels and long running boards on either side. From the front, two large yet almost useless headlamps sat on either side of a tall radiator approximating Mickey Mouse's ears. Ancient clockwork windscreen wipers hung down like worried eyebrows. This vehicle was so old the clutch and brake pedals were swapped around. On the plus side, it was very light and roomy. Earlier in its life, someone had decided to convert it to a people carrier with the addition of large side windows and a bench seat between the rear wheel arches. The arches were clad in plywood, which furnished the rear passengers with a sizable side table each. On this particular jaunt, AJ put Hammy the hamster's cage on her table. He didn't seem bothered about the journey. The familiar squeak of his wheel let us know all was well. So, with the family and pet all aboard, the proud pipe-smoking driver set off in a westerly direction. The vehicle was christened Calliope, rhyming with me, after the iconic steam organs of the late 1800s, yet Dad, just to be awkward, said her name in the same way the Greek muses pronounced. Proud folk stare after me. Call me Calliope. Tooting joy, tooting hope. I am the Calliope. Reedy's mirror. Gallon for gallon, Calliope drank as much oil as it did petrol. As a result, the aging vehicle would disappear under thick plumes of blue-gray smoke, particularly when tackling the gentlest of inclines. On one occasion during the trip to Cornwall, Calliope faced a long, slow hill just outside Sirencester. The top speed dropped from a stately 40 miles per hour to around 8 miles per hour, as she belched her thick oily smog. The poor driver behind wound up his windows and in his haste to pass the incontinent vehicle, he accelerated into the fumy fog. Unfortunately, he misjudged the distance and with a loud clunk, caught Calliope's rear bumper, a length of unforgiving cast iron. He didn't stop, but when Buridan's dad parked to examine the damage to Calliope, he found the rear bumper short by eight inches of quarter inch iron. He winced when he imagined the damage inflicted on the other car. Surprisingly, Calliope made it to Land's End with only one further incident. This time not her fault, being several inches wider than more modern vehicles, made navigating the narrow Cornish lanes a little more exciting. In this case, she was correctly making her way down a one-way thoroughfare when she came bumper to bumper with a posh new sports car coming the other way. Buridan's father surveyed the vehicle's driver with a touch of disdain before leaning out of the window and pointing with his pipe. "'Wrong way, old sock,' he announced, sounding much like Bertie Wooster. The man behind the wheel of the sports car said something inaudible, probably something a bit fruity, before reversing his car for over a mile. Unbelievably, Calliope also chuffed all the way back to Hayes. Sadly, she suffered a terminal ailment the following winter. Buridan wore a purple suede biker-style jacket with a white t-shirt beneath, covering his legs with the tightest possible straight velvet jeans, and on his feet, brown leather cowboy boots. He thought he looked like the dogs in his attire, and surprisingly, so did someone else. Halfway through the performance of a long-forgotten band, he gradually became aware of someone stroking his velvety bum. It was so packed in there that he couldn't turn around to see who the phantom ass toucher was, and was concerned the responsible party might not be female. The bum tweaking went on until the band finished, at which point he and Graham headed over to the bar. This was when a slim brown girl with long dark hair caught his eye. 
She was exotic and mysterious looking. Her large almond shaped eyes, long straight nose and full ruby red lips. She looked like a character from a fantasy saga. Later, Graham was to christen her Witchy Poo, which seemed a bit unfair, but it stuck. She ended up next to them at the bar and started to chat with Buridan. She introduced herself to Buridan as Emmeline. Buridan woke up with a start to find a naked brown body, half covered with sheets, next to him. His recollection of the night before was a bit hazy, but he was sure he'd had a great time, as was evident by the strikingly beautiful female by his side. After a few minutes, Emmeline stirred and arose from the bed. Still naked, she went to the window bay dresser and carefully brushed her long hair. Buridan watched her naked silhouette as she brushed. It was the sexiest thing he'd ever seen. London borough of Hounslow abuts Ealing to the south. Nick lived there with his wife and young son. Buridan would see Nick at least once a week to listen to obscure music, smoke cannabis, and discuss the meaning of existence. These meetings would sometimes take place at the King's Arms Brentford. This was where Buridan first met Eva, Nick's secret girlfriend. Eva was a smart, ambitious Jewish girl with an impish grin and a sharp wit. Not many months after meeting Eva, a catastrophe struck. Nick was going about his normal routine at work when he suddenly collapsed. The post-mortem revealed a cerebral embolism was the cause of death. Before his demise, Nick had played Buridan, an album by the flautist Paul Horn. It was set inside the Taj Mahal and recorded in 1968. It was pretty obscure to anyone outside jazz circles. However, it left a lasting impression on Buridan. A few weeks after this initial hearing, Buridan was in a bar on the Greek Isle of Santorini. The bar owner Theo played Buridan's sort of music loud while puffing on a joint. Buridan would while away his evenings with Theo, drinking local beer and enjoying free spliffs. Four days into Buridan's two-week holiday, Theo suggested a game, name that album. For every album name an artist Buridan got right, he'd give him a free beer. After six or seven correct guesses, Theo scratched his head for a bit before raising a finger, as if to flag inspiration. He left Buridan at the bar while he scuttled upstairs to his living quarters. He returned with a sleeveless record in his hands, carefully covering the label. Now, if you get this, I'll give you free beer for the rest of your stay. Theo placed the record on the deck and gently lowered the stylus. Buridan shut his eyes and smiled as he let the haunting flute music wash over him. After a long toke, he gently puffed out the plume of delicious vapour. He started to speak slowly and deliberately. Paul Horn, in the Taj Mahal? Remembering words from the sleeve, he added something about a natural reverb or echo for 28 seconds. Theo was speechless, but as good as his word, Buridan enjoyed free beer until he left Santorini. In hindsight, Buridan felt this was a fitting epitaph to those many evenings with his friend. A voice in his head would thank Nick every time he heard that album. Thanks for listening. I hope the excerpts whetted your appetite. There are many more tales to share, like the time we nearly destroyed Pinewood Studio, adventures in the USA and Hong Kong, and my brushes with the Mafia on three different continents, to name just a few. Please see below for links to the tools I've used to make this video and a link to my book on Amazon. Until next time, together let's tame AI's creative force.